my name is Trip Gorman, and in this episode of SME VC, I sat down with Hernan Fernandez, managing partner of Angel Ventures Mexico, where he's worked for the past 14 and a half years helping Latin American entrepreneurs. In this episode, we discussed the most challenging part of raising his first fund, pitching LPs, and how he caters his LP pitches for different audiences. We talked about what it's like going to college in Mexico versus getting an MBA at MIT Sloan, where Hernan sees Mexico following Brazil's growth trajectory, and where he sees it deviating, and what most Americans get wrong about Mexican students in the United States. We discussed all this and more in this episode of Samia VC. Hernan, could you start by telling the audience a bit more about your work history up to and including your current role at Angel Ventures? Absolutely, Trip. Very, very happy to be here. So um, I, I actually, I'm, I'm a very kind of like weird animal because I started as a lawyer in Mexico City. Uh, but the thing is, like being a lawyer in in emerging markets is like very different from what you will see in the movies in the U.S., right? So, uh, I the, the, one of the first things that I learned is like, you know, I I didn't want to be a lawyer because I I I probably over romanticized the role. But in the end, for example, if you're a business lawyer like like I was, you're kind of like being summoned once the deal is done, right? So the the whys are never you know for a lawyer at least in Mexico, it's more about like the execution, right? So. You know, we were looking into all of these deals and M and A's and acquisitions and whatever. And I was always thinking to myself, like, why is company A acquiring a company B? It's it's great, it's stupid or whatever. But you know, even some of my bosses are like, you know, like, just like shut up and execute on the deal and go collect those signatures, right? So it felt like kind of like frustrating. So I I really wanted to be kind of on the you know on the more engaging and the more kind of like value creating set of of business, right? So with that in mind, I I, um, I I I did my GMAT and everything, and prepared to to go to, go to to the MBA. I I thought to myself, yeah, you know, I'm gonna try, you know, I'm I'm gonna aim super high for in terms of an MBA, and I went, you know, to to the to the big seven schools in in, in the, the secret, right? And when I got my admission into MIT, I was like, oh, this must be a dream. They they, they probably messed up on this one, right? So uh, <laughs> I remember that I paid my inscription like that same day, the same day that, that I got my my acceptance, right? I was just super excited. I, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm the self-proclaimed admission mistake, but uh, and I, I saw that it was all part of a, you know, of a master plan. You know, some of the best two years in my life. You know, I made lifelong friends, and I had attending attended weddings in at least four continents, and uh, and you know, and, and really a, a massive, massive support from all my MIT friends, and uh, yeah, you know, like brothers for life. Uh, but yeah, so my, my story goes back as being a lawyer. And then after the, I mean, during, during MIT, I think was like fundamental for what we are building in Angel Ventures, because that's where I fell in love with the entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? Uh, I mean, you have so much access to angels, to, you know, to talent, to engineers, to research. It's just like overwhelming. And coming from Mexico, you know, where we're definitely not a deep tech country and, and it's more about the who you know than what you're trying to build. It just like felt so... You know, transformational, right? So uh, I, I, I would, I wouldn't say that I was like thinking about like doing angel ventures like from there, but I was kind of like the two go guy for many Mexican entrepreneurs or even like Mexican, you know, high net worth individuals or friends of mine that they literally told me, hey, dude, if you see anything that's coming amazing from MIT, let me know and I'll put in some money, right? And then I get you know like MIT entrepreneurs or friends of mine that's like, hey, I'm trying to do this like coin operated, you know, like gym in Mexico City. Do you know anyone with money, right? So. I was just like being this kind of like connector between two people. And uh, and I, I love that part of, you know, just like enabling these conversations, conversations right? So uh, after Sloan, I did have to pay the bill. So I actually took a role in consulting at, at Booz Allen Hamilton. And to be honest, I love it. And uh, I I love the team. I that, That's another like amazing school. And I have like great lifelong friends and uh, super smart smart people. You know, the, the, the challenge was very intellectual and... Uh, and my boss, you know, also took a big risk on me on hiring the lawyer that went to MIT or whatever, right? So that being said, you know, I I, I like, it, it was a short one year in consulting because to be honest, I kept dreaming about, you know, a building something and startups and entrepreneurs or whatever. And consulting was, you know, I, I think it's like three things that make a great consulting job, right? If your team is great, I always got amazing teams, you know, good people, smart people, very, very dedicated. Um, if the If the project is interesting, Man, that was kind of like a mixed bag, you know, when you when you're talking about kind of like layoffs or whatever, obviously there's there's kind of like a dismal effect into that. And finally the client. And I must say, many clients in Latin America, they it's kind of like this thing that they know that they're paying the consultants way more than 
many of their senior people do. At least I was, you know, like maybe 10 years ago. So they they see you walking into the room. It's like, I'm going to make your life miserable today. And you see that green slide over there? I want it blue. And, you know, to change those small things, obviously, like the, the partner in chat would say, like, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll have it blue by tomorrow, right? And that's, you know, all the team and change and everything is like a mess. But uh, I mean, that being said, I, I I do recall my 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 stint in, in consulting uh, uh, fondly. But uh, I, again, my calling was this, right? So just after after finishing my uh, or, or or going uh, after consulting, you know, I was already thinking about like, hey, you know, what we're missing in Mexico is an angel investor network. Uh, so, you know, I enrolled into the Angel Capital Association and did a couple of trips to the U.S. to see how the scene was there. And one of the first things that struck me there was that 80% of angel investors in the U.S. have been successful entrepreneurs, right? So there is a lot of knowledge uh, into what, what is a startup in the U.S. And, uh, and actually, many of the people that are angel investors, their money comes from, you know, kind of like startup tech or whatever, right? which was very different in Mexico and of course in emerging markets where we're talking more about like old money and whatever, right? So it was, it was very challenging to build that from scratch, but we do we did find a pretty interesting following in executives, right? Like CEOs, CTOs, CMOs of multinational companies, you know, uh, McKinsey partners or investment bankers or whatever. Those were the guys that, that probably were US trained or US European educated. They were getting high, uh, you know, years and high bonuses and they already, you know, were better off in terms of like sending their children to school or even having like a second home. And they were like trying to find what's next. Those were the people that, you know, were or thrive. And we landed just like softly and talked with a bunch of these people. And uh, and we set up Angel Ventures in 2000, uh, 2008 as the first, you know, kind of like professionally managed angel investor network in Mexico. Could you tell the audience a bit more about what Angel Ventures does differently? Yeah, uh, I mean it's it's funny, right? Because up to today, we're we're considered angel ventures, and we we have a uh, migrate more to AB, uh, AB AB fund one two three now. Uh, I would say that, or 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 uh, or times managing the angel investor network were very transformational. And the reason is this, you know, Mexico and and most of Latin America, actually all of Latin America, I would I would not consider them to be like, a, you know, deep tech countries. You know, it's. Uh, Obviously, there are like some deep tech pockets and Mexico is the fourth largest automaker in the world. And I think all of Latin America has a good tradition, for example, in deep tech and things that have to do with foodstuffs and, and agri-tech. But it's not like, you know, arguably the new Google or Uber, or whatever is going to come from the region, right? There's going to be like a lot of adapting technology to the realities in Latin America. And that's super exciting. And that's kind of like what venture looks like in our markets, right? It's like very different to Israel or the US or Europe. It's more about like getting bits and pieces of different business models and adapting them to Latin America. So um, I think what I think what, what Angel Ventures does uh, kind of like like different is is that kind of like we understand that we we were generalists uh, day one, right? So it was not that Hernan and Camilo knew all the answers. Actually, many times we had the input of an entrepreneur building something amazing that we have like zero idea of how to build it or how to actually be helpful to that, right? Uh, because again, we were generalists. So when we saw a deal in e-commerce, we say like, wow, this is amazing, right? But it was up until we saw like a 10th deal in e-commerce, we would say, well, you know, the customer acquisition and the ARPU and whatever, and the lifetime value of a CAC or whatever, in this one, probably there was the second product that we saw, is way better than the one that's like the 10th iteration of that. So hopefully by that time, we went back to the second product and say like, well, now we know enough, we would love to partner up with you, right? So uh, it's it's that's that's challenging in the region. And now we're... I mean, we're looking into projects in space or robotics or, or you know, like like a hardware stuff that's coming out in the region. And and we always, we love this job because you always have to keep on learning. But I think what, what we did different was that since we started this angel investor network, it was not only about the money of the people that you were bringing in, right? You, you knew that it was like a lot of, you know, tax or associations attached to that individual. So maybe he was, I don't know, true story, like the, the, the ex-CEO of Google, right? So... We'll call him and, and ask him, hey, what do you think about like this product or module or, or you know, like project or whatever, or these entrepreneurs? And we'll make the connection and we'll like eavesdrop on the conversation. And we're just like learning so much. So it was like literally every project that we saw, we learned something new. And that made Angel Ventures smarter in the way, right? So after you do that for, you know, 13 or 14 years, yeah, you can, you can add, a, you know, one thing or two to any different conversations or like so many different industries and uh 
and that has been amazing. So I, I, I would say that we will never consider, consider ourselves to be like an expert in anything. So very knowledgeable and very resourceful into the companies that, that we engage with. Uh, definitely, obviously, we we have done a lot of fintech and a little food tech in the, and some other industries that I think that we're very, very well versed and, and on to par with any, you know, like a regional, local or even international fund. So that's where we have a lot of value. But I think that we always have strived to be the best partner that any startup can have, right? And the two things with, where, where I think that we, we are very different and we work very hard. First of all, it's business development, right? The, the fact that we have still all of these angels and we have such a diversified limited partner base, uh, even with some small tickets, when we see it's a stellar you know, person we should have as an LP, we, uh, we actually leverage that network very much. And we currently have over 160 partners, most of them like corporations. And in some cases, we even run kind of like their open innovation projects. We have like a separate thing to do that where there's scouts for Latin America. That's the case like for some Japanese or Korean companies. Uh, and, and we engage a lot with some of these LPs, right? So many of the companies that come and raise money from angel ventures, they know that they're going to have a partner that helps them a lot with opening doors and in terms of sales, right? And obviously, you know, the other stuff that we do, a lot of recruiting and the, and positioning. And, and obviously, we, we work very closely with a lot of like service providers and try to get the best deal for a portfolio. And we have a lot of like perks from, you know, the AWS or Microsoft's or Google's or Salesforce of the world. So we try to kind of like get those like massive relationships to kind of like cater to our, our, our products, right? So I think that's something that our companies really, really value. Um, and the other thing that we have been, um, and, and this is part of our DNA, we we want to understand what drives an LP to invest into our funds, right? And it's not only about the money. Our funds have been super successful. Fund one, you know, we are targeting between eight to 10x return. We have, we're already way into the money. You know, everybody's like happy on that end. Fund two, you know, it's like 2018 vintage, so a lot of things to be done there, but it's also looking pretty solid. But we love having those conversations with LPs and, and understand what drives you to invest into a predominantly Latin American VC fund. So is it because your spouse or, you know, your your best friend or whatever is from the region and you want to give, give back? Fine, you know, let's host you anytime you're in Mexico City or in Colombia or whatever. Let's, you know, engage into these conversations, et cetera, right? Is it because you're a corporate, for example, with Nestle? We have an amazing partnership with Nestle. We we, we love those guys. They're super hands-on and, you know, it's it's a, it's a it's been a really, you know, very fruitful win-win relationship, right? So we're the de facto scout for food tech in Latin America for Nestle in Switzerland, right? So that has been amazing because we have learned a lot of food tech through them. They have been scouting many projects that were completely out of the radar, and we have now completed over 10 food tech investments, right? Where, you know, the, the, the entrepreneur can choose, hey, I don't want Nestle uh, knowing anything about my company. That's fine. Obviously, we have, uh, we can discriminate on those like, kind of like information rights. And whenever we see that flag or whatever, we can choose not to disclose anything to, to an LP. But the partners that do choose to work with them, obviously, they, they are doing a lot of amazing things and pilots. And we're now subscribing, you know, contracts with some of these companies. And it's amazing, you know, it's not like it, it's it, we're very happy having them as LPs and we know that they're super happy also having invested in with, with us. And we look with the, for these kind of like uh, like like corporates that, that have come, some of this vision, right? Like they know that setting up like a CBC in Latin America might not be a, a good uh, investment on their end. But if they if they want to scout the region, then obviously we, we love to help. And that's the kind of like relationships that we are we're, we're doing with them. So yeah. Um, Again, I, I will just like, you know, sum it up in those two points, right? For entrepreneurs, we want to be the best partners in terms of opening doors, business development, recruiting, and institutionalizing all of these perks that are, are out there for startups in the ecosystem into each individual company. And for LPs, we want to understand what drives them to invest in the region and beyond the financial results, which obviously it's it's a, it's it's an equation of the pipeline that you're getting and, and how good are, are you at negotiating deals. We want to understand what can make you super happy. What are those other KPIs that you as a corporate, as a family, as an individual, as a pension fund, as a government, really want to, to, to have as part of the investment in angel ventures? You mentioned in your intro answer about the profile of the LPs, and then in that, that answer you just gave about maybe why they would want to invest in the region. May I ask, what was the most challenging part of raising that first fund, and how did you overcome that challenge? 
Oof. Uh, I mean, our first fund was a 2012 vintage, right? So it was herding cats. We have over 55 LPs in that fund, and three of them are institutionals. You know, DFIs and development banks, Intermarket Development Bank. They were they were a huge sponsor for angel ventures. They were our largest check in the in the first fund, and they're they're going to do phenomenally well. Uh, but obviously, it was a matter of you know, once you have the approval of some of these big guys, the signaling that you actually can go ahead and take to the little guys, right? So uh, and and we we just got like a bunch of of people that were very they were they were very supportive, right? And, and you have to understand who you're talking to, right? If you're talking, for example, to the new generation family, then it's about you need to make them feel part of something important, right? Bigger than all of us, right? We're investing in the next generation of like Mexican, you know, companies. We are we have the challenge of of or finding the the Mexican version of Apple or the Mexican version of Uber. And we want you to be a scout because you know the the sourcing, screening, investing, post investing, and exit. We do make LPs a, 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 an integral part of that. And I would dare to say that we're probably one of the funds that has the most engagement with LPs by design. Um, so so we feel like a big tribe in that sense, uh, and we love working with our LPs. If we take you in for a small ticket, it's as important as us as any ticket from a pension fund, right? The pension fund will be more kind of like keen on. The government, the governance, and the reporting, and and things that cater only to the bigger tickets, but you know the conversations that we can have with those individual smaller angels, we love them, and and uh, again we 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 want to make them feel part of a big tribe, and and um, and, and and that's key. Um, but yeah, the the, the challenge was again uh, getting to twenty million, right? Because the DFIs, Inter American Development Bank, the Mexican Development Bank, and the Mexican Local Fund of Funds, Fund of Fondos amazing partners all to have. They wanted us to have at least a $20 million fund, right? Among the three of them, we raised uh, close to 11 million. So the other uh, 9 million actually were from tickets as small as 50K to the largest ticket was probably around a million dollars, right? But all of those conversations were super, super engaging. You have to you have to love, you know, the process of fundraising, right? It's not, the, let's, let's face it, it's frustrating. It's like literally, uh, you know, kind of like, like like dating when you have like snaggle tooth and eye short or whatever, but uh, but you have to enjoy it, man, because you're gonna get a lot of rejections. But you have to learn, you know, from all of those rejections, you have to keep all of this those LPs engaged for, you know, what's next to come. And sometimes you have to play with FOMO or whatever. Uh, so again, the, the many of the first LPs, if they were young, we needed to to understand that they want to be part of something big, bigger, right? If they were like mid age or whatever, then they were the for everyone, money is very important. But for me, the obviously, it was more about like leveraging their expertise or their inner entrepreneur. That's that's all thing very, very interesting. When we were raising our first fund and we were talking to someone in their 40s, when you when you ask them, hey, what were you doing back in 1999? 60, maybe 70 or 80% of times we heard from them, I was trying to be an entrepreneur. That was super fascinating, right? Because after the crisis hit, what happened was that they had to find like real jobs because you know their startup or whatever like went bust. And now their opportunity cost, I mean, think was think this was like 2011, 2012, their opportunity cost to be an entrepreneur was super high, right? So they could not go back to be an entrepreneur themselves, but they were like living their entrepreneurial dream through us as an angel investor network and now a fund. So that was fascinating to see, you know, how the how the energy and the people that we got at that end that, that end we you know was was happening, right? And finally, when we were talking to all the generations, you always had to go with, you know, we need to do this for Mexico, for the younger generation. It's part of your legacy. And that was like what really, you know, kind of like they stuck up, right? So uh, I don't know, it's, it's fascinating. And obviously you have to have a very good story to tell and be very cohesive on that story. You have to fit like different bits and pieces to each different constituent, right? And uh and again, it's all part of who we are, and we have been always huge fans of ecosystem building, and we love our LP base, and we love working with them. And unfortunately, you know, we have results to show on the financial side that that will keep us going. But uh, but it's it's a process right now. Angel Ventures is uh, fourteen years old, but uh, we we look forward to the next fourteen years for sure. I love it. What a great answer. I want to shift back to the MBA at MIT that you mentioned in your intro answer. You went to college in Mexico, but then got your graduate MBA at MIT. How did you compare studying in the USA versus Mexico? And then during your time in Boston, what did you find that Americans get wrong about Mexico? Ah, really good question. I mean, 
I I love MIT and I love Boston, you know, to with every single bone. And every time I, I go back to Boston, it's one of my happy places, right? You know, it's it's very nostalgic to be honest. Right now, for example, in terms of friends or whatever, I pro probably enjoy more going to New York or to to San Francisco. That's where my crew is at. But you know, going to to Boston is like you know remin reminiscing, you know, like the late nights and the late night pizzas and the stories here and there. So it's it's super bittersweet. But I love it. And and it's funny because now my friends are professors, right? Or most of my friends are professors. I mean, a few here and there, but you know, it's 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 great always to be back. And uh I, I owe so much to MIT um in terms, you know, personally and professionally that uh, it always feels good to be back. Uh starting there, I would say this is it's it's interesting. One thing is that, you know, I was two years at MIT Stone, not one single class, not one single class, I had a professor excuse from teaching that day which was amazing because you will think these guys are robots. These guys, you know, don't eat, don't sleep, don't, don't have like personal issues, like they're, they're all there. To be honest, in Mexico, I had amazing professors, but every now and then, you know, a professor will be stuck into something more important than giving classes or whatever. And he will send like a substitute or whatever, right? That happened not even once in MIT. So the degree of, you know, how people really take that uh, seriously, it's, it, it, it was like mind blowing. The other thing that I really like is like, you know, to be honest, like I think like the content, you can learn that in Mexico, in Kenya, in, in the US, in China, everywhere, right? What really makes it different is the quality of teachers and the quality of your classmates. That that's really it, right? Because when you're talking to, you know, Professor Christine Forbes and she she's when she was a, a senior advisor, economic advisor to President Obama, and she can relate, you know, yeah, you know, when I was, you know talking with Bono about this, I want you to go like, wow. I mean, honestly, there's there's a lot more people, uh, savvy people in economics than Bono for sure, but it's those kind of like anecdotal things that, that really make it engaging and, and you remember kind of like that story through those kind of like bits and pieces, right? Like whereas many other teachers will probably just relate to the academic part and they don't have like those, that, that kind of engagement, right? And, you know, the classmates were also equally impressive, right? You will have People that were really, really fighting for an NGO in in uh, in Africa, uh, the best profiles from investment banking uh, or um, or consulting. You will have royalty. You have the ultra wealthy. So it's one of those like very humbling things. I was like, dude, what am I, what am I the best at? Right? And I was like, you have to to find your way into you know how you you really stand out with just like a crew of superstars. But I will say this about MIT: what they had in terms of being a superstar. They were like some of the most humane and friendly people that I had the chance to to encounter in my life. It was was just impressive. And what what do people in the U.S. get wrong about like Mexico? Uh, the, the the one thing was like everybody in the U.S. thought that you know us Mexicans we go there and we want to stay there in the U.S. and find a job and just like you know embrace the American dream. And again, most I have a lot of American friends. I love coming to the U.S. I'm actually now in Austin, Texas, and, you know, and uh, we, we, we have a second house here. I just love it, and I love the energy in, in, in Austin and, and the U.S., and, you know, it, it's great, right? But the, the thing that I really wanted to do is go back to Mexico and change my country and make it more, make it better for entrepreneurs, make it more livable, and and, and bring solutions to the massive lower income and middle class and whatever. That That's what really drive, drove me. So, actually, I, I didn't even look for a job in the U.S. because as soon as I was on, I knew I wanted to come back and really change things, right? So, and I think that's that's the reality more and more today. You know, it's it's not like the U.S. is an amazing country and and you have the 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 best of the best in so many aspects, but you know the ties that bring us to 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 our countries is like, yeah, I I I, I never seen myself in the U.S. Maybe at some po other point in time or whatever, but uh, I was really eager to go back to my country and change it. And I I think like. Everybody thought, well, that, yeah, you're coming from Mexico, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's like, you want to stay in the U.S.? It's like, no, I want to go back to my countries and change that. I think that's also, you know, fair for my fellow Brazilians or Colombians or, you know, Africans and uh, and people in Middle East or or in Asia. You know, there's there's a few of us that are really committed to also bring back the, that knowledge, those contacts or whatever, and do amazing stuff in our in, in our countries, right? So even my, my US friends tell me, hey, you're a good Mexican because you went back to your country. It's like, uh, it's like, that was by design, right? Uh, uh, but but again, I I, I I think that's something that many times is like, it, it's not it's not very kind of like, a, like, like easy to grasp.
What a great answer. And I applaud you for remembering all three parts of that question. That was excellent. Uh, you mentioned Brazilians in that previous answer, and you tweeted recently a graphic showing the Latin American countries with the most unicorns, with Brazil obviously currently leading Mexico. How do you see Mexico following Brazil's growth trajectory, and where do you see it deviating? I mean, I, I think it's undeniable that today Brazil has the upper hand in, in BC, right? I mean, they, they obviously have a, an amazing economy. They're very resilient, really good entrepreneurs. Um, and, and usually, you know, up to two or three years ago, we also saw Brazil being more kind of like insular, right? Like it's like Brazil was like so big and it's like a different, you know, kind of like continent, right? Even language or, or culture is like also different, right? So, but... But, but today we're also seeing now Brazilian companies are actually coming for the rest of Latin America. So I think that has put out like more unicorns. I think Mexico has a unique advantage, which is proximity to the US. Obviously, you know, if you ask anyone in the Valley, in the Bay Area, whatever, like going to Brazil, it's a hassle, right? So maybe they, if, if they're Polish on the region, they're probably going to put someone someone there. But for Mexico and the US is like so much connectivity. There is like, I don't know, I, I read this stat the other day. There's like, I don't know, thousands of flights, you know, between different cities, between Mexico and the US every every week. So uh, connectivity is there and, and it's massive, right? Which also plays a little bit for brain drain, right? There's a lot of talent in Mexico that has gone to the US and are doing amazing stuff in the US. And every now and then they, they either come back or they also fundraise like from a local fund, which is a big opportunity. Um, what I really like about Mexico is that it's a way more open economy, right? And it's, uh, we have we're one of the countries with the most free trade agreements executed uh, all over the world. A very open country, even like to get visas or whatever, it's like very, very open. And it has now become like a natural hub for the rest of Spanish, the Spanish speaking world, all the way from Spain, uh, but also, you know, Colombia, Venezuela, Argentina, uh, Chile, Peru. A lot of entrepreneurs are flocking to, to Mexico and Mexico City in particular to, to try new things. So I don't, I, I don't think that the robustness of an ecosystem should be measured in the number of unicorns. Because those usually come, and I'm sure that some of those will also go, you know, given the, the current scenario. So it's it's uh, I mean, we have to work hard to to just like create the right conditions for for people to want to build build something amazing, right? I think Brazil has done a lot of good stuff in terms of re regulatory and in terms of you know like the government really enacting a lot of changes. And I think that uh, Mexico is is getting there. It's working hard, and uh, we have had. So pretty good conversations recently with the uh, government officials that really want to make this, you know, a, a priority in the government, and and th that could be super exciting, right? So is Mexico going to overtake Brazil in number of unicorns? I'm not sure. I think that the real fight is when you see like a really top-notch entrepreneur wanting to um, to build a new company, uh, it needs to be like a hard decision of why be between Brazil and Mexico, and hopefully. We can start persuading more and more to to choose Mexico, and then go for Brazil, of course. There we go. Switching completely to a different continent, could you tell us more about the purpose behind your recent trip to Korea? Ah, uh, Korea! I love Korea, man. It's uh, you know, the people are super friendly. The food is amazing. Uh, great sightseeing, and the technology is just like mind-boggling. You know, like they 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 they're really building the future, and Koreas are Koreans are so hardworking. So the, re the reason is like we have a, a partnership, one of our LPs is uh, KBIC, um, you know, based from Korea, which is part of the sovereign wealth of Korea. So we actually executed, uh, you know, a partially like Korean Latin American mandate into that. So Korea, before the pandemic, we were doing like at least two or three uh, trips as a firm per year, right? Uh, and we actually did three Korean investments and and uh, working on a, on a fourth one. Um, and, and I would say that, well, we, we were actually... Um, uh, invited by Mr. Marcelo Barra, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and it was amazing, right? Because it's, uh, I mean, I, I've been to Korea a bunch of times and obviously I meet up with my friends or entrepreneurs, you know, like kind of like partners or whatever. But going with, with the government was, was amazing in this sense because we had all the, I think they call it the Chai Ball, which is, you know, the, the top 10 Korean companies. We met this, with the CEOs, right? And we were in this like huge, you know, table in a very fancy hotel led by Mr. Marcelo Brard and all of these like startups. It was like kind of like crazy, right? Uh, and I have to say something, you know, good about uh, Mr. Brard is like, I, I heard rumors that at some point, you know, it was kind of like some dissent because it was only like a Brad's nameplate and a few of the, of the undersecretaries in the table and, you know, representatives from the 10 larger companies. And apparently some Korean companies 
said that, hey, you know, many of these startups are very young or, or new or whatever, and they're not to our level, right? And Mr. Ebrard said, you know what? I brought them from far away, and these are some of the best people that are talking about this generation or whatever. So I really want them to sit on the table. So they have to make makeshift kind of like nameplates. And it was all of us there sitting in this like big table with, you know, the counterparts of like multi-billion, you know, companies. And it was a very, very uh, interesting dialogue. And and we're still, you know, engaging with some of these conversations that can be all the way like from being, being LPs or to invest more in Mexico or, you know, uh, more investments from Latin America to Korea. It's a, it's, 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 it, it was a very interesting trip. I look forward to traveling with dignitaries in the future. I'll put that one on the bucket list. Um, but what has been your most successful investment and why? Uh, I mean, obviously we, we, you know, venture capital is like, whenever you do an investment, you need to make sure that, or to, to believe that that's going to be your best investment, right? Otherwise you're in, you're in the, you're on the wrong job. So I'm going to say that with the information that we have at the time, with the market that we know at the time, with the, with the, the team that we have in time, we try to each one and every single one of investments or best investments. That being said, now that we're old enough, we can, we can, we have the benefit of hindsight. And I would say that, you know, from a fun one, it's very clear who are the key winners. And those are Clip and Quest, you know, it's uh, two unicorns. And we were like literally the first institutional checks in both of them. And we love them very, very much. And it's now interesting because now they're joining Angel Ventures in our investment committee for FinTech, right? So it's the full circle. And, and obviously we we have a great deal of gratitude, depth of gratitude to these guys. And they feel sort of the same way. And uh, and now, you know, we're super happy of working with them. So uh, Clip is the Mexican version of Square, you know, like the largest uh, card processor in, in Mexico. Uh, a lot of us are a dear friend as well and, and a rockstar entrepreneur. And the uh, Queski led by Adalberto, Adal is, is amazing, you know, super humble, most data driven guy. He knows his, uh, his business, you know, left and right. Uh, they're the largest uh, online lender and the largest by now pay lender in Mexico. So both are, you know, massive companies, huge returns for funds and just like building the future. They are, they're really at the, at the forefront of innovation in anything that has to do with fintech to the most regarded uh, companies in Mexico. And they're just amazing. And we also have, you know, companies like Urban, Aprende, Homey, uh, you know, Plant Squad from Fund2. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure. I mean, we are spoiled in this job because you you get to talk with, you know, uber amazing people uh, doing amazing stuff and very, very fun. What should U.S.-based venture capitalists know about Latin America? No, there's a few. And obviously, they, it, it has been growing, right? We just hosted Altos Ventures, a fund that you know, I deeply admire and, and, and respect their co-investors in Kweski, uh, like, uh, like literally um, a couple of days ago and, and, and amazing, but they have already invested in the region. Uh, you know, you 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 obviously have Andreessen and Sequoia and all the big names, but even you know, uh, you know, for example, this fund that co-invested with us in Digit uh, Newstack, right? It was like their first Latin Latin American investment from Chicago, and we obviously you know took a bunch of calls into helping them feel the region, and now they have completed two, and I think they're about to close a third investment in Latin America. So I do think it it was a little bit of the flavor of the month, but I I think that a lot of these funds are saying you know great value and good entrepreneurs to actually bet on this for the long term. Particularly on, their state, on the early stage, I think that's the case. I think that, you know, some of the larger like Series B kind of like investors and you know, like the Tigers, Cold 2s or whatever, that's more of a little a bit of like a better weather of like the overall economy, right? We're seeing far less deals than today than they did, you know, like a few months ago. And, and obviously that's, that's, that's quite understandable. But uh, the question that you need to be answering yourself as a Latin American entrepreneur is like, who's going to be in this for the long run? And who's like the really devote me time, uh, money, and resources to to make my business thrive? And 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 I think that's where, you know, local or regional funds have an edge. And that's where you know we we always try to raise our hand and be competitive with uh, local entrepreneurs. That Angel Ventures wants to be the partner of the best entrepreneurs in the region. You mentioned for the long term. I have to ask, what are your thoughts on Web three? Is it a fad or is it the future? And if you think it is the future. What is the most pressing issue that Web3 is uniquely positioned to solve? Uh, I, I do think that's here to stay. Uh, the question is like how on, on kind of like what inter iteration, right? So I'm not sure, yeah, you know, like if the ape craze of NFTs or whatever will come back or we're going to see those prices. 
I obviously think crypto, you know, is here to stay. And, uh, you know, the question is like Ethereum or Bitcoin is like a better investment today. I don't know, but obviously we're going to have some form of that, you know, like kind of like digital currency. Uh, um, but, but and, and obviously I have to commend, you know, like companies like Meta that are just like betting the ranch into this, right? And, and see how this can be built. Um, I, I do think that, you know, the, the only thing is that there is, there is, um, that they're, they're kind of like building the, a future that I'm not particularly excited to live on, right? But you have to understand that there's probably people that, that do it. And it's interesting to see how children use Fortnite or, or, or Roblox, but as, as they grow up, it's like not, it's not like they're sticking to something that, that kind of like, like, like moves a, like, like, I don't know. It's not like you're using Roblox and then you're automatically like the user of something like very similar. And I don't know, people now, you know, I'm an exennial, right? Uh, I don't use, I don't perceive myself to be that much in the metaverse. And uh, kind of like the use case that we have discussed is like, yeah, I want to go to the movies with my, my, you know, my, my girlfriend in Singapore and everybody gets like, kind of like their, their, I don't know, their Oculus uh, on and you choose where to go into a shopping mall, five minutes or 10 minutes strolls and you get to see everything. And, you know, I'm probably be going to be wearing like a bunny avatar and uh, that I can then you go to, you know, a movie presented by Netflix, right? So still kind of like not clear how, kind of like what was like the, the best use case of that, but you know, the, 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 the real the physical world is so enjoyable. So um, you have to think about like, what's kind of like, what are going to be the trade-offs, right? So yeah, maybe flying the other side of the world for like a two hour meeting and then heading back, probably that's going to be overtaken by uh, by uh, by the, the metaverse or, or some of these like experience or whatever. But I think the bulk will still happen kind of like offline. Which I find really interesting is like things that have like a tie-in, right? Like all of these like uh, clothing brands or whatever is that are tying NFTs. I think that's that's smart and that's definitely something we we will continue to to see. We invested into this company uh, called the uh, Unio, which is building the universe for video games with uh, you know talent from Nintendo of America or X Grand Theft Auto. So super excited for that one, and uh, they're doing pretty pretty cool stuff. So I think the jury is still out. I think definitely it's here to stay. That will be my short answer. The thing is like. Um, I'm not sure what what form will will take it will, will be kind of like the predominant form or who's going to win that game. I agree with you in that. I do love the real world and I focus my time on improving that real world. So um, we will see what form that takes. I agree. So finally, I have to ask Peter Thiel's famous contrarian question, but with a uniquely Samia VC twist. What important truth about Mexico or Latin America do very few people agree with you on? Mm, that's a that's a tough question. I uh, I would say that you know, uh, as I mentioned, like deep tech, right? Like the dirty little secret of Latin American venture capital is that venture capital is finding innovation, as in deep tech innovation, is going to be very very small in Latin America, right? Again, there's some pocket some pockets in maybe hardware because of the all of the clusters that there exist. Or things in in food tech and stuff like that, right? But uh, but I think Latin Americans we're more creative into assembling bits and pieces of different things and building something unique to the region. Um, you know, when when we were when we we're investing, for example, I, there's a country which I love to to understand what's going on there, which is India, right? Because India has deep tech, and they are solving the kind of problems that are more relevant to Latin America and to emerging markets, right? Like because infrastructure, because you know maybe there's like not enough data or Gray card penetration or whatever, right? They're they're facing more the kind of problems that we that we face here in Latin America. I remember when 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 I saw you know all the money money went to you know the scooter craze and how much money got lost in Latin America. I was like, yeah, it's probably not going to end up well. You you kind of like see you know companies like for example, Lux is like on demand kind of like ballet parking service that you know raised much of cash in the in the U.S. And I was thinking to myself, you know, it's like it's so frustrating that in the U.S. you're trying. Maybe there's like, you know, two or three of these companies at on demand kind of like ballet service, which the use case was like, yeah, I'm running late to a meeting. There comes a guy in scooter, you know, like gets the keys to my car or whatever, fits a scooter into the trunk, and then he finds me to give the keys. Okay, yeah, I mean, kudos, that's great, right? But really, like with all these guys in Latin America trying to solve like real problems for, you know, like millions, if not billions of people or people in Africa, or whatever. I mean, that's that's probably, you know, more, more naive on my end, but I was like, oh, dude, if... If some of these companies got like, I don't know, one fifth of what's going on into that vertical, this would be a completely different world, right? And obviously, you know, needless to say, now 
some companies survived, uh, but but some of these like verticals, the whole vertical as a whole, it's gone, right? And it raised so much money from, you know, the the, the trunks of venture capital. Um, so yeah, that's that that's I guess I, I guess like the thing like uh, a lot of team people will want to believe that yeah, how 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 we perceive venture capital is fundamentally different. Here it's about a business of like backing really good teams that are bringing bits and pieces of innovation from different business models or backgrounds or or countries, whatever, and build something that's new and really, really has amazing product market fit to the vast majority. You know, we have companies like Nubank, like Clip, like Rappi, like all of this. You know, you we will kind of like argue if that's innovation, right? That probably happened somewhere else, you know, like fast or whatever. But what these guys did was really adapted to the local context and they had like a good story to tell. They raised, uh, you know, tens or if not hundreds of millions in cash. And here we have some of the most relevant countries and companies in Latin America. Yet another excellent answer. Hernan, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Semi VC podcast today. Well, it's a pleasure trip and I uh, look forward to uh, to hear more from your audience and, uh, and thank you again for having me. Thank you for watching this episode of Semi VC. My name is Trip Gorman. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you view the podcast. And don't forget to check out our newsletter, DealFlow LA, which can be found by going to dealflow.la.